If you have your Bibles, <laughs> we'll go. Amen. We'll go to First Corinthians chapter 10. Hallelujah. First Corinthians chapter 10. And I'm just going to recap a little bit. And then we, we are hoping to pray deliverance prayers at the end. And really um, break things that need to be broken in our lives. Now, if you're here last Sunday, I began speaking about discerning temptations. Discerning temptations. And uh, the foundation of scripture that we were looking at uh, was 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12 to 13. Let me just read this for just to recap and lay a quick foundation for where we're going to be going today. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you uh, except such as is common to men, but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape, but that you may be able to bear it. Now, that word discern, uh, or rather, uh, therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed. That word take heed is the word blipo, which means to be aware, to discern, or to be aware of. He says, let him who thinks he stands uh, be aware or to discern lest he fall. Now, no temptation. So that's why the Lord gave me that title, discerning temptations. And it's important that we understand uh, how to discern temptations, especially in these last days that we're living in. And I say this because uh, you can never be successful in spiritual warfare if, you, if we haven't come to the place of understanding how to overcome temptation. Now, one thing we saw last Sunday, therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except that which is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. We saw last Sunday, and we were really uh, uh, focusing on common to man. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is, or as is, uh, such as is common to man. And I, re and I say that not all temptation is common to man. Satan had to limit, or rather God had to limit Satan's ability to tempt. Now one thing that we need to understand that God in uh, eternity past, because there is two eternities, there is eternity past and eternity future. Eternity past, because God has no beginning, amen? He has always existed, he's always been. Don't even try to figure it out, you, you know, it, you can't Eternity past. So the eternity goes that way and goes this way. Amen. But somewhere in eternity, God created the angels. We don't know how long the angels were created, how long they were in heaven uh, for. But he created the angels and he create, created different divisions of angels. He created the the. The seraphims, the cherubims, and uh, the, uh, the archangels, uh, the warring angels. He created different divisions of them. And, uh, and of one of those angels that he created who was very, very integral uh, to the glory of God, the worship of God, uh, was Lucifer, who was a cherub, an anointed cherub. That's what he was. He wasn't, he wasn't a seraphim. He was a cherub. He was an anointed cherub, as the Bible says. Now, if you look, and, and I've mentioned this before, but if you look, at the Ark of the Covenant, you will see two angels whose tip, the tip of their wings touch each other. And that represents, uh, uh, that was Lucifer's job before he fell. He was the, the anointed cherub that covereth. His job was to cover the glory of God. So when he fell, he was replaced by two angels. That's why you see those two angels there. Now, one thing that you've got to understand, Satan had an ability to tempt and to bring temptation. And uh, we're going to look at an, the anatomy of temptation probably uh, next Sunday or the Sunday after as the Spirit of God leads uh, as, we take, as we go down this journey of understanding uh, temptations and how to overcome them and the process of them. So one of the things that happened is that Satan began to, uh, not only did he want to take over heaven because he began to look at him himself. He, he began to look inward and instead of looking outward and giving God the glory instead of reflecting everything back to God. You know, that's what worship is, is when we give God he, what belongs to God. Amen. The Bible says, give to Caesar's the things that are, that are what? Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. So every praise, all glory, all honor, 
all power, all might, all that belongs to who? To God. And every time there's a temptation to touch that, it is possible to fall to the same things that Lucifer fell for. So he began to receive what he was meant to reflect back to God as the angels were worshiping around the throne. And he began to say, you know, I will ascend up high and I will be and I will be. And God said, no, you will be cast down. You will be brought low. And so there was, and let me say this, God never fights with angels. Amen. The battle was never between God and Lucifer. God if God steps into that battle, the battle is finished. Amen. It was Michael. God even didn't bother. He said, Michael, you deal with it. Praise God. And Michael came and the Bible says that there was war in heaven. Now what had happened is that Lucifer in his ability to tempt had managed to tempt a third of the angels in heaven. And they had fallen behind him and they were now part of his army. And they began to fight with Michael and his army and Michael got a hold of him and cast him out of heaven. And those angels that did not keep their proper place, or those, those particular angels that followed him, they were bound up. They were bound up. In the book of Jude, the Bible says that they were, that they are reserved in, in a place called um, Tataru, which is, which is if hell was, 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 was a ground floor. Tataru is the basement of hell. If you read, and we're going to do an, a study on this, I'm just, I'm, and, I, and I did not touch on this last Sunday. I don't know why I'm going here, but we're going to go on to here. Amen? It's going to help us. But he was put in Tataru. So some of what you call demons today are not the angels that fell back then. The only one who was left, who was not in prison under the everlasting chains, according to the book of Jude, which tells us, and they will be released in Revelation. The only one who was allowed to walk around was Lucifer. And that's because of the position that he held. Even the angels still honor that position. He doesn't have the power, but he still carries the position. That's why the Bible says he was part of the Beneo Elohim. At a certain time, the Beneo Elohim or the sons of God will appear before God and Lucifer was with them. How did he have access to still go to the heavenly council and appear there with all the sons, the, the angels and the archangels? It's because of the position. He's the leader of the opposition. He still has the ability to go to that place. But all the minions and the angels and all that, they were they were being reserved under darkness, and and one of these days we'll look at where did then the demons come from? Where when where 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 do they come from? And 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 we can we'll look into the scriptures about that. So so what we were looking at last Sunday is the temptation that is common to man, and so God had to limit Lucifer's ability to tempt because his ability to tempt is so strong that he could even tempt angels who are seeing God face to face. Who are worshiping him, who are around his glory, they turned on his back. I mean, we have never seen God's face. We've never been to his glorious presence in the throne room. We've never been there. So you can imagine those angels who have been in heaven for eternity and eternity were able to be swayed by the enemy and turn their backs on, on God. So God had to limit his ability to, to tempt. So the temptation that, that he had, when he limited or put the restrictions on the enemy, this is why the Bible says, says that the temptation which is common to men because there's a level of demonic temptation that can even cause angels to fall. Amen. And so if he can bring down angels, what chance do we have if God didn't limit him? Satan has actually a lot of huspa. Amen. Enough to even try to tempt God. We see this in Matthew chapter 4 where he takes, tries to tempt Jesus. You know, he has a lot of guts to even try to bring God himself down. Can you imagine? He even tried to, to, to bring that temptation. So God had to limit him and, and put these restrictions on him so that he would, when it comes to us, that he will never be able, be able to go beyond a certain point. And last Sunday we saw that every single person has got a different uh, level of toler tolerance when it comes to temptations. Amen? So the Bible says that God, it says, therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to men. So this is no temptation common to God or to even angels, but it is common to men. It is, it is, it is temptation that has been limited that we can handle. And God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able to. So with the temptation he draws a line of demarcation on this, in the sand and it 
tells the devil, you can go thus far and no further. Because I know this individual, beyond this, they will fall. So let me say this, each and every one of us have, will have no excuse when we stand before God on judgment day. We can never say that we were tempted beyond what we were able to. Amen? So every temptation that comes our way, we can overcome. Come on. We can overcome. Why? Because God will not allow us to be, to be tempted beyond what we are able to endure. With the temptation, not only will he limit the enemy by throwing, drawing a line of demarcation on the sand and tell the devil you can go thus far and no further. Not only will he do that, but he creates a way of escape with the temptation. Amen. So it gives us two opportunities. So the Bible tells us that he has given us everything that pertains to what? Life and godliness. So everything that we need for life, to live our lives here on this earth, God has already made it available to us. But also that pertains to godliness. We have everything that we need to live a godly life here on earth. We saw Matthew chapter 5, uh, the last verse of Matthew chapter 5, where Jesus says that we should be perfect even as our Father in heaven is perfect. And that was the level of perfection that we have been called by God to walk in. Not just like a man, but, but like to, to walk in that dimension. It would not be possible if God had not made the way. But he has made the way for us to walk in that level of, of holiness. Now, I'm going to look a little bit this morning about, uh, we're going to, just begin to, to, to look at a few things, and, uh, and I'm going to begin probably by looking at the three categories. Now, we're going to look at this limitation in order, uh, uh, this, this categories of temptations as far as the earth is concerned. Now, First John chapter 2, and I began on this, we actually closed with this last Sunday, First John chapter 2, verse 15 uh, to verse 17. The Bible says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Now, one thing that we began to look at last Sunday is verse, we started out in verse 15. And, uh, and this is where I close. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, temptations always begins with the, in the arena of affections. And I said we have to be careful. We have to look at our affections. The Bible says, therefore, it says, do not love the world or the things of the world. Satan will use our affections as a doorway to bring in temptation. And that's why I said, if you love food, guess what? That's what he's going to use. If you love money, guess what? That's what he's going to use. Satan will, all, will never tempt you with what you don't love. He'll never tempt you with what you don't like. That is why if you have never smoked a cigar, he's not going to come and tempt you with one. If you've never smoked cigarettes, he'll never come and tempt you with one. He already has a list on things that he knows. This, these are the things that this individual likes. So we have to look at our affections. Now, the Bible says, do not love the world or the things of the world. It is our love of the world or the things of the world that begins to become the, the avenue that Satan uses to come in and begin to bring the three things, the three areas or the three dimensions of temptations that he has been limited and restricted by God to. Number one, the last of the eyes. Number two, the last of the flesh. And number three, the pride of life. These are the three limitations, the scopes that God has put on the enemy, on the devil. And he has said you can tempt them, but you are limited to these three areas and don't go beyond that as far as this is concerned. Now we see this in the book of, in the book of Matthew. Now it says this to us, and, and we talked about this, and I'm, I'll come back to the, to the affections. Do not love the world or the, things, uh, uh, or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, it says for all that is in the world, ev everything. And he, and he categorizes what's in the world. It says it's the last of the flesh, the last of the eyes, and the pride of life. 
Now, these are the three areas that Satan tried to tempt Jesus in, in these three same areas. Number one, the lust of the flesh. The Bible talks about the lust of the flesh. So Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And when he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, the Bible says he went there to fast for 40 days. He went there to prepare himself for the assignment that God had given him, the anointing or the calling or the, the, the thing that God had, his ministry, what God was given him to do on this earth. And let me say this, the moment that you begin to prepare yourself to be used by God or to serve God, that's when Satan will always target you. For me, it is very easy for me to, like there are weeks, I go, I only have one meal a day. I'll have a meal a day and because it's my tradition, it's just the way that I am. I try to just have one meal a day. I may have a little bit of a coffee or drink somewhere in the morning, but then I'll have only just one meal a day until the moment I announce I'm fasting. Come on. As soon as I say, okay, this week I'm fasting. And to me, fasting is just a meal a day, a small meal a day. Now, all of a sudden, there's all kind of hell breaking loose. And I'm having, I can smell everything. My smell is heightened. I don't know why the fridge now looks like it's stocked with all sorts of stuff that, that is calling my name. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Amen. The moment you begin to say, I'm going to prepare myself for God. If you went to the desert just for as an excursion, just a bit of a holiday, a bit of a break, Satan would not come to tempt him. But because he was going there to prepare himself for the work that God had sent him. Your assignment, let me just say this. It's important to understand that your assignment carries spiritual warfare with it. What most people don't understand is that whenever God gives them a mantle or he gives them an assignment from heaven, there will be an attack or there will be a test as far as that assignment is concerned. You know, I listened to uh, this uh, um, Robert Sladen. He was being interviewed and he was speaking about mantles because he does this study on different men of God over the years. And he was talking about the battles or the mantles and how, and how there's warfare that is attached to certain mantles. And he was speaking about the mantle of Catherine Kuhlman. Catherine Kuhlman had the most tremendous anointing of God that was on her life. And she just, I mean, she moved in the gifts and the power of God. And, 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 and people would, would get touched by the glory of God. But there was a warfare that was on her mantle. And the warfare on her mantle was marriage and heart issues. Those are two areas that she was attacked. She was attacked in the area of marriage, but she was also attacked in the area of her heart. She always had a heart issue. And so when she passed on and, and Benny Hinn got the anointing because Benny Hinn walked, I mean, received the mantle that came from, from Catherine Kuhlman, uh, you know, uh, Robert Sladon went to see Benny Hinn in the early days and warned him and said, Benny, you need to understand that the mantle you carry has got warfare in two areas, marriage and heart condition. And these are two areas that Benny has been tested. How I many of you know what I'm talking about? For those who have followed Benny Hinn's ministry. He went through a divorce and thank God he came through and remarried his wife. And he had a lot of marriage issues initially and God's worked. And then heart issues. Even I think a couple of years back there was a word, you know, a word that went out to pray for him because he was having heart, heart problems. I remember in one crusade where he was... Uh, uh, people were praying for him and he fell under the power of the Holy Spirit uh, because he was believing God for, uh, issue, for his heart to be healed because he had these palpitations in his heart. That We have to understand for every mantle that there, there will always seem to be certain spiritual warfares that can be connected to those mantles. We have to understand that every time somebody goes into a place where they're receiving from God to serve God in order to do an assignment, to fulfill an assignment that God has given them, there will always be a, a warfare that is connected to that. Why? Because every time God opens a door of opportunity, there will always be opposition. Paul put it this way. He said, a great and effectual door has been opened to me, but there is great opposition. There is great opposition. And Satan will only attack you because of your position. I always say the opposition is because of your strong position. Amen. 
If you didn't have a strong position, Satan will not what? Attack you or, or come against you and oppose you. So God p- begins to release something. He wants to release a grace or an anointing upon your life. And so they will be, uh, there will always be warfare that will be attached with that particular particular uh, 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 ministry or that particular assignment. And one of the ways that Satan will fight ministries is through these three things. The last of the flesh, the last of the eyes, and the pride of life. These three areas that are spoken of in, in 1 John, we can see them when Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. The Bible says when he went there into the wilderness and he was fasting and praying, the Bible says that the Satan came to test him. He came to test him. In Matthew chapter, uh, if we look at uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 to 11, this is the account. It says, and Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterwards he was hungry. And when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. So we saw these three things in the world. The Bible says the last of the what? The last of the flesh. The first thing that Satan did when he came to Jesus is that he began to try to bring the temptation which we call the last of the flesh. He said to him, he said to him, why don't you turn these stones into bread? Turn these stones into bread and eat them. So be careful of the appetites that are in your physical body. Satan will never will, will leave you alone until the appetites have been aroused. Let me say this. So the Bible tells us that Jesus was in that place and he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights and afterwards he was hungry. Afterwards he was what? Hungry. There was a physical appetite that, was, that, that came in his physical body because he had not eaten for 40 days. And the Bible says afterwards he was hungry and Satan came to him and said, why if you, if you, get in him to doubt who he is in Christ or who is he is in God, to God rather. He wanted him to doubt his identity. Remember, the father just spoke when he came out of the water, when he was baptized by John. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. He released identity into him. He told him who he was. He spoke to everybody around and said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Every temptation, Satan will always come to try and test your identity in Christ. If you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, t- command these stones to turn into bread and satisfy your physical appetites. Satisfy your physical appetites. And so Satan will always look, and let me say this, because we are fallen. This human body of ours is fallen by nature. There are appetites that are in this body that we have to stay on top of until the day we go to heaven. Come on, somebody. Some of these things, I can pour oil on you. It will not work. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Come on. There are some things which are common to the flesh. They are common to the flesh. And so Satan has authority to connect with the flesh. And we have to understand that the appetites, when we talk about this warfare that we read in the scripture, how how the spirit wars after the flesh and the flesh after the spirit, we are talking about the appetites of the flesh fighting against us or the spirit man and how we walk with God. We have to be careful about the appetites of the flesh. It is important that we remain or we keep our flesh crucified with Christ Jesus. Amen. Somebody say it's important to crucify your flesh. Because if your flesh is not crucified, Satan will have access to you. He will have access to you. Let me give you a revelation. The Bible says in the book of Genesis... God came down after, 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 um, after you know, the sin had happened and, and Eve had eaten the fruit and Adam and judgment. You know, d- during the time when God was coming to bring judgment. The Bible says he cast the snake, which, which was the enemy, the devil at that time. And it says, all the days of your life you shall crawl on the ground and you shall eat the what? The dust of the earth. 
You shall eat the dust of the earth. The curse of the enemy is that he shall eat the dust of the earth. Now go back, rewind it to where God, the Bible says that he created man in his image and after his likeness. And what did he do? He got into the earth and he took the earth. He took humus. He took the soil and he began to form man. He's your physical body. You are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a body. Your spirit came from God. Your soul came from God. But your body came from the ground. And there's a law that the Bible speaks, uh, speaks about that everything goes back where it came from. That's why when you die, your spirit goes to God and your soul goes to God. But your body goes where? Back into the ground. Amen. So what did he do? He reached into the ground and he formed the body, a physical human flesh body out of the dust of the earth. And he breathed into him, Numa, and he became a living soul. So he cursed the Satan. Listen to this. He said, all the days of your life you shall go on your belly and you shall eat the dust of this earth. In other words, if this flesh is not dead, Satan has a place to connect. Amen. This is the dust of the earth. So we have to understand that we don't walk in the flesh. We have to walk in the spirit. Because Satan has got authority over the flesh. He has the ability to connect and manipulate the flesh. That is why we need to keep the flesh on the cross. Paul put it this way, for I am crucified with Christ. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. I am crucified with Christ. So the flesh has to be crucified. What does that mean? That means that we have to learn to deny the flesh. He said, you cannot be my disciples until you deny yourself. Pick up the cross and follow me. It is impossible to pick up the ministry, pick up the assignment, pick up what God has given you and called you to do and still indulge in the flesh. Those two don't go together. Jesus said, you cannot be the cost of discipleship. You cannot be my disciple until you what? Deny yourself, pick up the cross, and follow me. Because the flesh will fight the cross in your life. If those two are in the same place, their flesh will fight the cross in your life. That's why you've got men and women of God who have been fought by the enemy. And the enemy wants to get them out of the ministry, wants to get them out of serving God, out of, out of being able to do what God wants them to do. The flesh will put you to sleep. It will disconnect you from the assignment that God has in store for you. That's why when Jesus went up the mountain, took Peter, James, and John, and he said, you stay here and pray. He called them into the ministry of a watchman intercessor. And the Bible says that Jesus will come back, and he said, why are you sleeping? They were snoring, fast asleep. Three times he came back to them, they were fast asleep. And Jesus said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh, the flesh, the flesh is weak. They were there to pray, but the flesh removed them from their assignment that God had come to give them. Let me tell you, your flesh will fight you. It will try to keep you from being able to fulfill the assignment of God on your life. That is why you got to fix it before it fixes you. Come on. You got to deal with the flesh. You got to deal with the flesh. The flesh will put you to sleep. And it is when men slept that the enemy comes in and his soul stares. Bad habits begin to spring up and you don't know where the habit came from. It is while the flesh had lulled you to the point of sleeping that the flesh came in. And the flesh began to sprout certain things. You find yourself lying. You find yourself exaggerating. You find yourself saying this and doing that. And you're wondering where did this come from let me tell you if the flesh is not dealt with sometimes you wake up in the morning and the weeds have sprang up you don't even realize where did this come from where did this come from the spirit is willing Jesus said the spirit is willing but the flesh the flesh is weak and that word weak is the same root word that was used for the name Delilah Delilah put Samson to sleep and when Samson went to sleep he lost his eyes and he lost his hair he lost his vision 
And so you've got to understand Delilah represents the flesh. The word Delilah, if you go and look at the root meaning of the word Delilah is weak, weak. Same word as Jesus said, the spirit is willing that the flesh is weak is Delilah. Delilah will try to put you off and keep you from being able to fulfill the assignment of God on your life. And one of the things that happens when we pick up the cross and we don't deal with the flesh is that we lose our vision. And number two, we lose our anointing. The flesh will fight your vision and it will fight the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon your life. That is why if we allow the flesh, we will find that we will always be victims because what gives us authority over the enemy is vision and the anointing. You will find that there will be a struggle all the time. Why? Because where there is vision, there is provision. Where there is vision, there is dominion. For where your eyes shall see, as far as your eyes will see, God says, I shall give it to you for your inheritance. You lose your vision, you lose dominion, and you lose ground. That's what Satan wants. He wants to take your eyes and take your anointing because of the flesh. So Jesus warned the disciples and he said, the God of this world has been judged and he has nothing on me. He said he has nothing on me. Why? Because the flesh has been crucified. He has no avenue to come in. The flesh has been crucified. And so it's important that we learn to do that. And so every time you have these urges and desires, never ever fulfill those urges or those desires. One of the ways we crucify those desires is by, by, by standing on the word of God and by refusing to feed those desires. Because when you feed them, it's like pouring kerosene on fire. Sometimes we always say, well, just a little bit. Let me tell you, some things you run from. Come on, somebody. Some things you run from. Joseph, the Bible says, on his way to, to, the, to the place that God had sent him, Potiphar's wife came to him, and Potiphar's wife said, come and, and, and why don't you sleep with me? The Bible says he got up and he ran. Look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, you better run. When it comes to the last of the flesh, don't stand there in the name of Jesus. I rebuke you. That you run for your life. That's why the Bible says, flee youthful lusts. Come on, somebody. Somebody say flee. Sometimes running is the best way. God will make a way for you. Praise God. You better run and run for your life. There are things in this world when it, because when you're going to understand, when it comes to the flesh and the last of the flesh, it is the hardest thing that you can overcome. Sometimes the remedy is to run. You run for your life. You run for your life. You run for your life. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. And the righteous run into it. And they are safe. Come on somebody. I said you better run. Amen. You run. You say Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Jesse Duplantis checked into a hotel one time. And this lady walks up to him. She's dressed a certain way. Praise God. And says, starts flirting with him. And he turns around and he looks at her and he shouts, Jesus! Jesus! She took up, got up and took off and ran. Don't say I'm not married. You just, you, the name of the Lord, you better run. Do you hear what I'm saying? Hallelujah. That's why when, when Tish Shelton came here, she has a tremendous ministry to, in the brothel here at the vault, what they call it, the strip club. She goes there every week with a bunch of ladies. That's why I said no man in this church is allowed to join that ministry. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Amen. How many of you here when she came and told us about that ministry? It was a great ministry. Told us all the testimonies. All these girls are getting saved and all that. And I remember leaning to Ruth. And I said, no man in this house is called to that ministry. You are not called. And not all women. That is a special ministry. Come on, somebody. Amen. You need to know your capacity. 
Somebody say run, run, run. <laughs> now, one of the things you need to understand, and this is something that we, we, we have to look at, the last of the flesh, when you look at the last of the flesh, many men of God, many, many, many men of God have been dropped down and many women of God have been pulled down because they never understood this. The Bible says at a time when kings go to battle, David was up on top of the roof of his house. And he looked down and he saw Bathsheba taking a bath. The things that happened after that was one of the biggest black spots in David's testimony. At a time when kings go to battle, make sure when it is time for battle that you are in the battlefield. One of the way reasons why the enemy pulls a fast one on many times is because we are in the wrong place at the wrong time. At a time when kings go to battle, there is a time that kings need to go to battle. Hallelujah. And when we come to that place of going to battle, we can overcome and we can defeat what the enemy wants to bring against our lives. Okay, my iPad has decided to go. All right, wake up. Praise God. Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> okay, let me, let me, we need to get through this as much. This, this is going to be a series because I don't think I'm going to get through most of this today. It says, now when the tempter had come, he said, if you are the son of God, verse 3, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Because temptations tells you that it almost, it's almost deceptive to the point whereby it makes you feel like your very existence is determined or dependent on you indulging. Let me say this, if you say no, you will not not die come on you will not die praise God are you hearing what I'm saying if you say no to the devil you will not die nobody has ever died from saying no to Satan man shall not live by bread alone but by what Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. In other words, what say, Jesus says to Lucifer, he, he reminds Lucifer. He says, listen, my sustenance, my living, my being alive is not because of this. It is what keeps me up is what comes from his mouth. In other words, a man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from his mouth. In other words, what he says, what he says is what is going to keep me alive. It's what's going to keep me walking. Walking is what's going to keep me living. That's what I need. I need God to speak to me. The Bible says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. It says, if you receive what comes out of the mouth of God, and this is why reading your Bible is important every morning. Take the word, hide it in your heart. That word of God in your heart is for your safety. It inoculates you. It vaccinates you from some of these temptations. Give us this day our what? Daily bread. So make an effort to read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation before you do anything. Open the scriptures and begin to read the word of God and take those words and hide them in your heart. Hide them in your heart. The Bible says, the psalmist said, I have hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. Why? Because it tips the balance on your side. You become heavier than the sin that is standing on the other side. Hallelujah. You're carrying many times because we are bankrupt in our spirits. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It is written. Satan can never argue with it is written. Hallelujah. It's important that we understand this. Now listen to this. So when it comes, so I've, I've dealt with the last of the flesh. Let's quickly look quickly to the next one. It says, then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and he said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. 
For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you. And in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Now the second temptation that the Bible tells, tells us about is the last of, of um, we, we talked about the last of the eyes. Uh, this one is the pride of life. The pride of life. What did Lucifer do? The Bible says that the devil took him up into the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. What is the pinnacle of the temple? The pinnacle of the temple is the topest, most highest part of the temple. First thing you need to understand, not all promotion comes from God. Everybody wants to be at the pinnacle. Of the temple. Amen. Everybody wants to get to that level. Everybody wants to get to that place. Where TBN is looking for you. God TV is looking for you. You are. Let me say this. Selfish ambition is a demonic thing. That feeds the pride of life. Last of the flesh. We are dealing with the pride of life right now. So what did Jesus do? The, the Bible says Lucifer took him up to the pinnacle of the temple. I always say this with every minister and every child of God. Your responsibility in this kingdom is not to see how high you can go, but how low you can go. Jesus, who did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. The Bible says he humbled himself. And he brought himself low, even to the point of death. And God so highly exalted him and gave him a name that is above every other name. Anytime there is a temptation to promote yourself and to give yourself a name that did not come from God, you have to be careful because what Satan props up, he pulls down. The responsibility of every man, woman, every child of God, especially in these days of social media where we are trying to promote ourselves and put ourselves up there and to be seen of men. It is important that we understand our primary responsibility should be to go as how low can I go? How high you go is God's responsibility. Humble yourself in them under the mighty hand of God. And in due season, the Bible says, he shall lift you up. It is God's responsibility to promote you in ministry. Never, ever, ever through selfish ambition or competition, try to see how high you can get when it comes to the things of the kingdom. Our job is to see how low we can go, low still. Low still. How low? Because this kingdom is about servant leadership. It's about, it's about understanding. It's about the towel and not the title. Come on. Jesus said, whoever wants to be greatest among you, I'll teach you. He brought a towel and he said, you must be prepared to wash the stinky feet of my disciples or my people. Hallelujah. He set the foundations of how to be promoted in this kingdom. This kingdom, we are promoted through humility and through service, not through self-promotion. Where there is self-promotion and competition, I have seen people whereby they pull each other down, try to expose each other. You try to step on my head so you can look tall. That is of the devil. That is of this world. And that is what is wrong sometimes even with how church is structured. Because many times we structure the church in the same way that the corporations and the businesses and companies out there are structured. We structure the church in a hierarchical way. We've got the pastor up here and then the, 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 the executive pastors and the, apostles and the apostolic prophetic leaders. Then down here draw diagram and then down here you've got the department heads and then you draw down and, and then you've got the members and it goes all the way down here. Listen, the kingdom of God is not hierarchical. Are you hearing what I'm saying? People have said to me, can you draw a structure so we know who's where that and I listen. This, we have to understand because when you have hierarchy, then everybody is trying to jump on top of everybody else so that they can be on top of everybody else. The kingdom of God is not hierarchical, it is functional. 
Are you hearing what I'm saying? Apostle is not a title. It's a function. Pastor is not a title. It's a function. A prophet is not a title. It's a function. Everybody in the body of Christ is supposed to find their function and function in their function. Come on, somebody. As a matter of fact, the body of Christ is supposed to relate through it to each other through partnership. Because when you have hierarchy, you have competition. But when you have function, you have partnership. I'll give it to you in scripture. The Bible says when Jesus t- told the disciples, cast the net on the right side of the boat, they cast the net on the right side of the boat and they brought all these fish in, that it was so much to, br- I mean, it was way so, too much fish to bring in. What did they do? The Bible says they called the guys from the other boat. They said, could you come so that we can network together and bring in the fish? You've got to understand the kingdom works through partnership. It doesn't work through high Hierarchy. It's not about who's bigger, who's who's boss, who's bigger than who. Are you hearing what I'm saying? If you need a hierarchy, if it will help you, let me give you the hierarchy. The hierarchy is this. You got the members here. The second one is the department heads. Then below that, you've got the, 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 the pastors. Then you've got the apostolic prophetic leadership and the executive pastors. And then you've got Pastor Jimmy and Ruth at the bottom of the totem pole. Why? Because we are the servants of everybody. Are you hearing what I'm saying? If, that's what, if you want structure, that's what it is. But in this kingdom, it's about function. That's why when Peter called the other, the other guy to bring his boat so that they can bring in the fish, did he have a say on how he runs his boat? No, because it's his boat. Come on, somebody. Amen. Why? Because when it is partnership, you look after your function, they look after their function, and through partnership, you can bring the harvest together. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So in this kingdom, it is about servant leadership. It's not like the world where you've got an organizational structure on who's on top of who and everybody's trying to climb the political. That's where the political spirit comes in, in the kingdom of God. And everybody's trying to be political and climb on top of the other and, and get to the place whereby, we, 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 I mean, it is demonic in nature. Jesus never left a hierarchical kingdom. He left a functional kingdom. And let me tell you, the only one who has any level, the Bible says that Christ is the head of the church. Everybody else, we are partners together. This hand has no more authority than this foot. This foot does not have more authority than this hand. We together work so we can move. Come on, partnership is the reason I go from here to there without falling down. When we all understand our function and function in our function, then the body of Christ begins to thrive. That's why I believe in training and equipping the ministers and every person in this house to be, to, to be equipped for the work of the ministry. Because you have a function, hallelujah. You have a function, you have a function. So we have, we have to ask ourselves, what is your function? You function in your function. If you need somebody else who's in a different function to come, you then work together. Call them in and you work together and you bring in the harvest. When the body learns to work through partnerships, we can network. We can work the nets. We can bring in the harvest. So go away from titles and begin to think function. What is your function? Because when you understand function, you don't even need to be ordained to function. Because function comes from God. And he gave some to be a prophet. Come on. To be apostles. To be pastors. To be teachers. Now some, that's why I can look at some of you and call you pastor. For example, my good friends here. You, this, they're pastors. They don't have to be ordained here for them to be pastors. They're pastors. Because that's their function. If you're a foot here, you're a foot there. Come on, somebody. If you're a foot there, you're a foot there. We don't need to recognize you and pour oil and demand. Oh, now you're now a foot. Praise God. You are a foot. You are, that is your function. Come on, somebody. 
We have seen, I mean, I have been in the past in ministries where there is that hierarchical competitive jealousy, people swiping on each other, trying to undermine one another, trying to pull each other down. When you understand the work God has given you, you are faithful with the assignment, the work on your hands. Put your hand to the plow and don't look back. Don't look down. Don't look around. You serve God with everything that you've got. Hallelujah. So the thing about promotion is the thing, let me just say this. If you want to be promoted, and I think I'm going to pull the plug here. If you want to be promoted, build a relationship with the feet of Jesus. Hallelujah. The Bible says, I'll give you scripture. The Bible tells us that there was a, that that Jesus was going to Jairus' house. And as he was going to Jairus' house, to raise Jairus' daughter from the dead. The Bible says a woman with the issue of blood came behind the press. And as she was coming behind the press, you can imagine she's crawling on the ground because you can't touch the hem if you're not down there. So she's down there. She's coming behind. You see, most people have said, Lord, I want to see your hands. I want to see. Listen, develop a relationship with his feet. So the Bible says that she's coming to that place whereby... She, she touches the hem of his garment and she is healed. Jesus stops and says, who touched me? Now listen, the disciples are saying, what do you mean? Everybody is bumping shoulder to shoulder with you. They have a, res- resp- they have a relationship with your shoulders. They have a relationship with your face. They have a relationship. They are bumping into you. But you see, who touched, who got the attention of Christ is the one who had a relationship Now, let me say this. Promotion doesn't come from east or west. It comes from God. The moment his attention was on her, the attention of everybody else was on her. When he said, who touched me? She tried to hide. Because that was her personality. She didn't want to be seen. She just wanted to worship him. Because anytime you talk about the feet of Jesus, you're talking about the heart of worship. Like the woman with the alabaster jar came and poured, and, and the one who worshipped Jesus and with her tears and, and dried her, his feet with, 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 with her hair. It talks about worship. She was in a place of worship. And, and, and the Bible says she realized, somebody touched me. And the Bible says, Jesus kept on talking, somebody touched me. Nobody, they were like, every, people are pushing and jostling and, and doing all these things. The Finally, Jesus turns around and his attention, his attention is on her. And when his attention is on her, everybody else's attention now is on her. How do you become famous in this world? Get his attention. If his attention is on you, the attention of everybody else will be on you. Are you hearing what I'm saying? If your ministry is to his feet, And not to be seen, but to his feet. The promotion that comes, that comes from God, is the kind of promotion that, and let me say this, if God promotes you, God will sustain you. If you put yourself up there, then it is your responsibility to keep yourself up there. Now listen to this. We're going to finish with this. If we can have, you can just come up on the keyboard, that would be great. We'll finish with this. The Bible says they took him up to the holy city and set him up on the pinnacle of the temple. And then he said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you. And in their hand they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against the stone. The sin of presumption. Pride always goes before a fall. Always goes before a fall. Pride always goes before a fall. Presumption. Presumption. Many times pride is manifested in presumption. Presumption is when we go ahead of God and expect God to follow. Presumption. It says if you put yourself up here, and this is the promotion, because anyone that is promoted, that gets to the pinnacle of the temple, and it is the devil that took them up there, The next thing that happens is that the devil throws them down. And he knows how to throw them down. Because if he took you up, he can take you down. If God takes you up, God will keep you up. He will preserve you. Be careful because not all promotion 
comes from God. That's why Jesus would heal people sometimes and hide and just disappear. Disappear. They would look for him. Where? Where is he? Remember, this is why King Saul was rejected by God. What did Samuel, the prophet, say to Saul? When you were small in your own eyes, did I not use you so? When you were small in your own eyes, did I not anoint you? That's what God said to King Saul. He was rejected because of presumption. Presumption is the sin that will always uh, uh, be reflected by those who have allowed, allowed pride to come into their hearts. Presumption. God said to him, when you go into that city, Saul, kill everything. He went there and he, and he kept aside the animals. He kept the, the sheep and the goats. And, and when, when, when the prophet came, he said, why is it that I hear the bleating of sheep? He said, I kept this aside so we can worship God. Didn't God tell you to kill everything? Presumption makes us think we know better than God. And God's an angel said, that, do I desire sacrifice or obedience? Are you hearing what I'm saying? He will always try to bring people down. It's important that we understand humility is the way to go. If we humble ourselves, God will exalt us. He will take us to that place. And if he takes you there, you don't need Facebook. You don't need Instagram. You don't need a shout out. You don't need anybody to do anything to try and prop you up. God himself will blow your trumpet himself. And when he blows your trumpet, let me tell you, you'll be known from the North Pole to the South Pole, East to West. Everybody will know who you are for the glory of God. And one thing that you need to understand, self-promotion is when we use God as a platform to stand on so we can be seen. But when God lifts you up, when he lifts you up, you begin to understand that you are the platform that he should stand on so he can be seen. The attitude is very similar. The first one, they use Jesus as a platform. To stand on so they can be seen. This is promotion that comes from the enemy. That will always end up with a fall. Pride goes before a fall. But the second one is this. Is when we become a platform. And we say God you stand on me. You be seen. He said if I be lifted up. I will draw all men. Not to you but to myself. They will come. They will come, but they're not coming to you. They're coming to him. That is the kind of promotion and influence that God wants to release. That is biblical. It comes from the place of humility. Hallelujah. Now let me finish with this and then we're going to pray. The Bible says, and he said to him, if you are the son of man, throw yourself down for it is written, shall give his angels charge over you and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. And Jesus said to him, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Showed him all the kingdoms of the world. This is the last of the eyes. We have seen the last of the eyes, the last of the flesh, and the pride of life. The last of the eyes. Showed him the kingdoms of this world and their glory. Showed him the kingdoms of this world and their glory. Now, next, next, next Sunday or next time when we, hear, we, we share, I'm going to talk about the eye gate, this last one. Because it's important to understand how to put a, a, a covenant, to, have, to make covenant with your eyes. Job said, I have made a covenant with mine eyes not to look at a woman to last after her. He said, I've covenanted with my eyes. It's important to understand that the eyes, are the, are, they can easily become the eye gate or the gate of affection. Now, this is a very big door because of the world we live in. We live in a world that is flashy. Neon lights, everything. You cannot walk through anywhere with your eyes closed. You have to open your eyes. So you have to learn to guard yourself. 
Your, our eyes, let me read this scripture and, and we're going to close with this because I want us to really understand the importance of this. And, and, I, and we're going to pick on this the next time. He says, so when the woman saw the tree, saw the tree, how did it fall? It began with what she saw. It started with your eyes, the last of the eyes. Last is born whenever there is no God over our eyes. Now watch this. He says, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, for that it was pleasant to the eyes. Watch this. Not to eat, not to the body, pleasant to the eyes. Pleasant to the eyes. A tree desirable to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate. And she gave also to her husband with her and he ate. The last of the eyes. It begins in the book of Genesis. And we're going to look through the pages of scripture and see what the spirit of God speaks to us. Matthew 6, 23, 22, 23. The lamp of the body is the eye. This is the gate to everything. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body is full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Let me say this. God wants to give us revelation on how we can be able to deal with the last of the eyes. And we'll see how God deals with it. Jesus, remember, anything that comes through the eye gate comes to bring compromise. Shows him the glories of this world. If you will bow, I will give compromise all right we'll finish there let's stand up on our feet